to uh, welcome all who are now watching the rest of the service online. Thank you for being there. And uh, we, have a, we have a nice crowd here, not a huge crowd today, uh, but we have a whole bunch of people watching from home. Uh, the last couple of months, as you are aware, ever since we had our Thanksgiving banquet, uh, ever since then, we've been hit with snow and sickness and holidays and ice storms and, uh, and the like. But the God will be good to us. Have your bulletin handy. Uh, there are some words that we encourage you to write down. I think this will bless you today. And uh, open your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 10. You might say, whoa, what, where's that? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Or as we used to say when I was a kid growing up in Sunday school, we called it Deuteronomy. All right. All of us want to make this a successful year. Every one of us. We've, it's been in our thoughts. It's been in our mind. What do we want to do? What do we think God wants us to do in the new year? There's not one of us sitting here this morning or at home who would say, you know, I hope that in calendar year 2023, I hope everything falls apart. I hope I have a horrible year. I hope things go from bad to worse. <laughs> Nobody thinks that way. Nobody wants that. We've all been thinking a little bit about 2023. We've thought just the opposite of what I just said. I want it to be a good year. I want it to be the year that God can and will bless. I want to look into this new year very optimistically. Let me give you the best news. What we call calendar year 2023 could be the year that Jesus returns again. Now, it, it doesn't get any better than that. We thought that 2022, uh, that the Lord might come, and he did not. He did not. But we are now one year closer to that event. All of us want to have a successful year. There are six primary areas that all of our life seems to fall into these categories. This is not an exact science, but generally speaking, there are six broad categories. They do overlap a little bit here and there. But our lives in 2023, there will, we will have a spiritual life. We will have an emotional life. We will have a mental life, a physical life, a social life and a financial life. That is life itself. Now, you and I, it's not wrong to look into the new year. It's not a wrong thing to make resolutions. I did see, however, something last night that just uh, uh, made me laugh. I thought, did I just wake up Darla even though she's in the room back there? I laughed pretty good. Here's a cartoon of, a, uh, of a, um, a man and a wife, and they're eating snacks feverishly. And the caption said, hurry up, we've only got 10 more minutes before the new year. And I thought, oh boy, that speaks to my heart right there. So I got up and went to the kitchen. We found a little package with two sugar cookies in it. And I killed them. I took care of that real quick like. But that is a snapshot of our life. We have a spiritual life, an emotional life, a mental life, a physical life, a social life, and a financial life. By the way... Be a good steward this year and give attention to every one of those aspects in your life. It is good that you pay attention to your spiritual life. Connected along with that, for the most part, is your emotional life. Pay attention. 
Along with that is your mental life. Do something keeping your mind going. Expand your mind and, and let, it, uh, let, it, let it expand your world. You also have a physical life. Give that attention. You have a social life. Give that attention. Give that some planning. You have a financial life. Give that attention as well. Do some planning there. What troubles me about life, and I, I, I am not a great counselor. I do some counseling here or there, and some pastors do a whole lot more counseling than I do. I think part of the problem when it comes to me and counseling, there are two factors. Number one, in our church here at Bethel Baptist, God has brought in you. And for the most part, you are very substantial, stable Christian people. Okay? Now, we'll help anybody through a crisis. We will do that. Your, uh, your pastor would help you. Your church would get behind you if there was a tragedy by praying for you or, or whatever that may mean. But God has given us some people here that do not need counseling constantly. I think another reason I don't do a lot of counseling is because of that sermon that I preached on counseling several years back. Many of you will remember I had a three-point sermon about life. And it went this way. Number one, cry me a river. Number two, build a bridge. And number three, get over it. How many of you remember that sermon? All right. All right. Maybe that's why a lot of people don't come to me with a lot of problems. I don't, I don't, I don't know the connection. But let me, let me say this. When I say get over it, I meant get over the bridge. Get over your bridge so that you can help somebody else. Because somebody else will be going through circumstances that mirror yours. And be a help. Be a help. Bring them over that bridge. What does God want me to do in 2023? What does God require of me? How do I please God in 2023? Now, here's the exciting part. We're starting a new year. This morning, I'm preaching two sermons. Some of you don't look too excited about that. From two different texts. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 10, and then we're going to look at Micah chapter 6. But Deuteronomy chapter number 10, look at verse 12. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command thee this day for thy good. Look at that first phrase in verse 12. What doth the Lord require? Require. Does God have the right to require things of us? Does God have the right to expect a certain level of conduct? Obviously, the answer is yes. Now, keep your uh, pencil or your bulletin or something there and turn with me to the book of Micah. Now, everybody knows where Micah is. You go to the table of contents and you start looking for the book of Micah. You get past, you go about the middle of your Bible, you'll find Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. Then you'll get to the book of Hosea. And uh, uh, then you'll get to the book of Joel. And then there's another book called Amos. And if you're a certain age... There is another book that dropped off here called Andy. <laughs> you have to be a certain age, and if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. You go to the book of Obadiah, then you go to Jonah, then you come to Micah. Now, in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, 
we have one of the most popular, most well-known, one of the most memorized texts in all of the Bible. Look at verse 8, Micah 6. And he hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Does, he ever, has, does God ever uh, have the right to require a certain level of conduct from us? The answer is obviously yes. Now, we as the people of God, we must not only realize the bar that God has set, we must raise the bar and the requirements upon ourself. There's a song that we sing, it goes like this. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. It talks about higher ground, higher ground. Higher ground. Keep going. Keep progressing. Keep stretching your mind. Keep stretching your spiritual understanding. Those are the things that God requires from us. Now, let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 10, and we'll start there as we begin. In Deuteronomy chapter number 10, let me give you a little background. God called Moses up into the mountain. When Moses came down with the tablets of stone, he reacted to what he saw. The people were worshiping. They'd made a, they had made a, um, a golden calf. And Moses said, oh, you've got to be kidding me. And he threw down the tablets of stone and they broke. And then God said, come on back up. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. And at that time the Lord said unto me, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me into the mount, and make thee an ark of wood. And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And I made an ark of shittim wood and hewed two tablets of stone like unto the first and went up into the mount having the two tables in mine hand. And he wrote on the tables according to the first writing the ten commandments which the Lord spake unto you in the mount of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them unto me. And I turned myself and came down from the mount, and I put the tables in the ark which I had made, and there they be as the Lord commanded me. So we have the second writing on stone by the hand of God, what we call the Ten Commandments. Keep in mind that the Ten Commandments are the first ten. There are over 600 commandments to the nation of Israel. We primarily are aware of the first ten. God did it a second time because God is serious. What do we look at in verses 11 and 12? And here's where I want you to write some things down. First of all, what does God require of us? First of all, is the right attitude. The right attitude. Now, look at verse 12 again. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God? This is the right attitude. This is the right perspective. This is the right approach. This is the right beginning point. Where does it all start? The book of Proverbs says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Where do we begin? Where do we begin a new year? We begin with the right attitude, the fear of the Lord thy God. Now, keep in mind that when we're talking about the fear of the Lord, it's not like, oh, God's going to destroy me. I, I'm going to look over my shoulder. No, no, no. We're not talking about that. We're talking about an attitude. We're talking about respect. We're talking about the fear of God. We're talking about making God the first priority, having the right attitude, having the right frame of 
mind. It's the right attitude. Number two is the right direction. Look at that next little phrase. The next little phrase says, to walk in all his ways. That's the right direction. To walk in the ways of God. To walk the narrow path. To walk the way that God expects us to walk. To walk in such a way that it is the way of obedience. The way that is laid out for us by the Lord himself. We're talking here about the narrow way. We're not talking about the broad way. We're talking here about the narrow way. The right direction. Know the path of God. Get on the path of God. And stay on the path of God. Stay there. Uh, I realize we live now in what's called 2023. And I know that we, in the religious world, we're going to get new waves this year. And we get, we, in, the, in the past, we've had uh, new waves. This is the answer. This is the way it's going to be. In the last 20, 30 years, we've seen people develop ideologies and develop programs Because they said, we have never gotten it right to this point. But if we do that this way, we have finally figured it out. And we're going to do it this way. And we're going to call our program A, B, C, or D. And here comes this huge wave. And everybody gets involved. And then we realize that the wave did not bring in good things because it was a tidal wave. It was a tsunami and caused incredible damage to the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. Beware of what people say is new Beware of when people say, oh, we, oh you, your church has got to do it this way. Oh, we finally figured it out. It's been all wrong up to this point. I was listening the other day to a CD where a couple of gentlemen were talking about yet, yet another version of the scripture. Yet another translation. And as I listened to this, I thought, oh, oh, these guys have figured it out. Oh, if this new Bible hits the, uh, uh, this is the greatest of Bible. We, we've never had a, the right Bible all these 2,000 years of New Testament church history. To hear them talk, you would think that here when this Bible starts getting used, there's going to be people everywhere who are going to say, I need to get saved. I need to get back into church. I need to do this. I need to do that. Always be wary of the new wave. Because if anything, this book says, get back to the old path. Get back to the old way. Get back on the narrow path. And don't be taken up by every new wave that that comes along. Here's Bethel Baptist Church, still using the standard version of the scriptures, still singing from the hymnal, which one verse of most of our songs will give you more doctrine than 30 minutes of bebop, all about me and here we come along and you know what I'm thankful for I'm thankful for the fact that there's people like you and people like those that are online who say I'm still going to stick with the narrow path we're still going to stick by the stuff we'll take a look at what's new but no 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 we're not going to let it detract us from the right direction here's number three the right affection 
Fear the Lord thy God is the right attitude. To walk in all of his ways is the right direction. And to love him is the right affection. What are you going to love in 2023? What is going to make your heart say, that's what I'm going to do. That's where I'm going to go. That's what I want to do. My friends, it's all a matter of what's in your heart. It's all a matter of your affections. This book says set your affections on things above. Number four is the right behavior. Look at that next phrase. And to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. There's the right behavior. That's the right way to do things. Uh, have you noticed a pattern here? The right direction. Fear the Lord. Uh, the right attitude. The right direction. Walk in His ways. The right affection. And to love Him. The right behavior. And to serve Him. Let's go to number five. The right action. And that is verse, 12, uh, verse number 13. To keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes. Now, there are five bullets that we've picked out from there. The right attitude, the right direction, the right affection, the right behavior, and the right action. What does this say? What does it say? What does it say about me? Well, aren't I the one that develops my attitude? Am I not the one that determines my direction? Am I not the one that uh, loves what I want to love? Am I not the one that determines what uh, behavior I want? Am I not the one that determines what I'm going to do? If anything that is very interesting about this text, point one, about him, not about me. Point two, about him, not about me. Point three, about him, not about me. Point four, about him, not about me. Point five, about him, not about me. In fact, my friends, if you and I will live our lives that way, it's not about me, it's about him. You'll have a very successful 2023, and you will have a very successful Christian life. It is about him. It's not about me. One of the things that I have been blessed with through the years is to study theology. I, I, I love reading theology. The hard stuff, hardcore doctrine. I'm the only preacher I've ever met who understands and can explain the difference between equal ultimacy and extreme symmetrism. You say, what is that? I don't remember. But it sure sounds intellectual, doesn't it? I mean, aren't you thrilled that your pastor has studied the difference between equal ultimacy and extreme symmetrism? Why would anybody in their right mind ever study something like that? Well, because the guy who was mainly responsible for bringing up what we call extreme symmetrism was Dutch. You want good reasons? There they are. I love theology. I love doctrine. But you know what I found? The more you study, you come out with the same thing that John the Baptist said. He must increase. I must decrease. Most of Christianity today is more interested in I increasing. But when you increase, if this is God, he must increase, I must decrease. If you increase me, you're automatically decreasing God. You can't do both. It's one or the other. 
So the essence of what we're saying here today is he must increase. I must decrease. Now, let's go to Micah chapter 6. I know, we've got to find it again. It, by the way, let me help you a little bit. If your Bible's the same as mine, that's page 1014. But I doubt if anybody here this morning has the identical Bible that I have. Anybody have 10,000? Oh, you do. All right, there's one. At least you and I have the right Bible. All right, Micah chapter 6. As I said earlier, this is one of the most well-known, most memorized, and most familiar verses in all the Bible. Notice verse 8. O man, he hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee? There it is again. Does God have the right to require this of me? Yes. Why? Because he's God. He sets the rules. He sets the rules. God does require this of us. And what are they? What does God require? What to do? Look at that answer. Do justly. This has to do with your actions. Your actions. Do justly. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. Just the other day I was listening uh, to a sermon in my office. A sermon by a fellow by the name of Tom Williams. Uh, 45, 50 years ago Tom Williams was a very important uh, part in the development spiritually of my family back in Illinois. And Tom Williams is still preaching. At least I heard this sermon in 2018. I've seen a picture of him since then. It looks like he's in uh, a wheelchair. But here's what he said. He was preaching on, not on this text, but on this theme. Do the right thing. Do what is right. He said that his first wife, and they had a child, and the, the mother and the child died. This is a long time ago. This is 50 years ago. He said, I'll tell you the truth, with God as my witness, it took us 18 years to pay off the final medical bills. But we did. Because it was right. That blessed my heart. I thought, you know, that's what we need to do. You and I, no matter what's in front of us, we need to make do the right thing. This is the proper action. Do justly. Here's number two. What to love. What does he say here? To love mercy. This is the right affection. Do justly was the right action. Love mercy is to, uh, to have the right affection. What is mercy? What is mercy? Is it different from grace? I believe that it is. Let me explain this in very elementary terms. Mercy is what keeps me out of hell. Grace is what takes me to heaven. Now, that's not a, a difficult formula. It's not an advanced formula. It's very basic. It's very 101. Mercy keeps me out of hell. Grace takes me to heaven. What is mercy? It is the withholding of judgment. The withholding of Judgment. That's mercy. That's mercy. Let me, let, me, let me give you a historical reference to that. When you were a kid, you did something stupid. And your dad said something along these lines. 
I brought you in this world, I'll take you out. I'll make another one look just like it, doesn't make any difference to me. Don't raise your hand on that one. We don't want to hear the story. But for some of you, that sounds horribly familiar. I am here because mercy intervened. And my mother on more than one occasion said, you can't do that. You can't do that. And that's the essence of mercy. Don't give them what they have coming. That's mercy. Any of you have the same problem I have? Well, I'll be honest with you. Mercy is not one of my strong suits. One of my salient features is patience. <laughs> I am not good at patience. How many of you are, just by a show of hands? Liars! I am not a patient person. I do not like being stuck in traffic behind a big van or a big truck. Because I know that the light has turned green and they're lollygagging. There's something within me that wants to put the car in park, get out of the car, run up to the window and say, Would you be so kind as to move forward? No, there's sometimes I want to tap on the glass and say, Move! What's wrong with you? I, I'm, not a, I'm not a patient person. I've had to talk to the Lord about that. I want things to happen. I want them to happen now. Now, I'll be honest with you. I am not real good sometimes at mercy. Sometimes, and I think we're all this way to varying degrees. Mercy? Are you kidding me? Look at what they just did. Are you kidding me right now? No way. Am I going to be merciful? I have a problem with mercy. When it comes to our southern border, I'll be, I'm, being, I'm, I'm exposing my heart here. I have a problem being merciful. Those people streaming across our borders. And my family, they all came across the border too. Legally. Legally. These people are coming in illegally and they are being encouraged to do so by our government. What in the world? going on. Can't we put a lid on this? But quite frankly, some of those people, all they want is another opportunity. I'm not saying all of them are that way. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes we have to be merciful and bite our lip, bite our tongue, and keep quiet and don't say anything. And it hurts. It hurts. Then we get reminded of the pit from whence God brought us out. 
And you can't be merciful until you remember and are grateful for the mercy that God extended to you. Let's go to number three. How to walk. It says walk humbly. This has to do with association. Do justly, action. Love mercy, affection. Walk humbly, association. Let me ask you a question. Is this hard to do? Is this impossible? Oh, no. Is it hard to do? No. Then what's our problem? We are our own problem. We are the problem because we want more of the attention on us. We want more of what we want. We want more accolades. We want more praise. We want more attention. These two texts today should tell us something, and that is he must increase. I must decrease. Make much of Jesus in calendar year 2023. And at the end of calendar number 2023, you'll be able to say, I've done the best I could to walk with my God. What does God require? I did my best to do it. This, my friends, is what God requires of us. These are not suggestions. These are not admonitions. These are the commandments of God. This is required. Let's you and I determine to do it. If you're here today or online and you're not sure you're a Christian, let me tell you about the requirements from God. There are two. Repent of your sins and trust Jesus Christ. That's it. Yeah, but I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to come up with my own plan. I want to come up with my own concoction about how I'm going to save my soul. No, you will not. God requires you to repent. To repent. That means to be so sorry for it that you're willing to give it up. You're willing to change direction and you are repulsed by your own sin. So much so that you're willing to say, that's it, I can't, I can't, I can't believe it. I don't want any part of it. I can't believe it. That wicked, that bad, that sinful, and I'm sorry. And then cry out from your heart and trust Jesus Christ and say, I don't know, I, don't, I can't explain it all, but somehow, some way, I believe that Jesus, when he died on the cross, he died for my sins and for my soul. Those are the requirements. You say, what about your giving? That's not a requirement. Well, what about all the rules? That's not a requirement. The requirement to be saved is to repent and believe. Father in heaven, may we accept the challenge from your word today. May it be good for us. May we be reminded that these are not suggestions. They are the requirements. By your grace and for your glory, may we submit ourselves to the requirements of Almighty God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.